I was thinking, I'm the bad guy, he was the good guy. And, and when I say to people, my homosexual brother was more moral than I was, they go, well, you must be confused about your theology, because that's the worst thing ever. Jerry was a very creative guy, and he, um, while other kids were out doing uh, athletic kind of stuff, and, and he did play baseball, things like that, he loved to design things. And he saw a Barbie doll at one time and thought that the design of that doll was just so perfect, he said, I, I'm gonna make some clothes for that doll. And so he began designing fashions for Barbie dolls, just not something that he talked about a lot to other people. He just had that sense of design. And then later, of course, he would become an architect. Jerry was a very, very masculine brother, uh, very, very handsome, and uh, all the girls loved him in his teen years, and he uh, dated a lot. And I never had any suspicion that I had a brother uh, that was struggling or that was gay. And in fact, you wouldn't say at that point, and I don't think he would say, that he was uh, quote unquote gay at that point. He was confused about his sexuality and he struggled a lot. But to understand my brother's whole story, you have to realize when he was five years old, he was at a uh, church camp with my older brother. And at that church camp on the very night that he accepted Christ as his savior, he was molested by our pastor's son. And years later, he would say that when that molestation occurred, it seemed to ignite something in him uh, that he, he doesn't think other guys ever had to struggle with or deal with, but it produced a, an uneasiness with relationships with women. The family we were from, we were the very typical strong Christian family. On the outside, it looked like that everything was great, but on the inside, we were it seemed like we were all strangers growing up in the same family and my parents also. One of the tragedies of our family was that my mother's father, my grandfather, who my brother Jerry was named after, uh, committed suicide. That was such a shame inflicting incident that my mother, uh, I, I'm telling you, it, it threw her into a totally different world of self-protection, privacy, disconnection. So I was raised in a family where my mother was struggling with this suicide of her father, and then my dad was a totally disconnected man, certainly from my oldest and brother, and then Jerry, uh, a little more connected to me because I played football. But my father was raised by a dad who didn't know anything about emotional connection. And so in any kind of struggle that was going on, my struggle with prom promiscuity and having sex with all these people, uh, with women, uh, there was no connection there. There was no connection with Jerry or my older brother. Jerry was uh, a very moral young man, and he knew the Bible. He actually preached. Uh, he was very involved in church work, and he ended up as a um, city planner uh, for the city of Easley, and he moved to that town when he was 26, and he had never had a, uh, an experience with another man until he was 26 years old. He had never had sex with anybody until he was 26, and he ended up meeting a guy who took him to uh, a bar for a drink, and it happened to be a gay bar, and Jerry felt like, my brother felt like he was at home. He felt you know, total acceptance, uh, freedom, all this stuff uh, that he had never known, feeling like I'm one of you, uh, all of this love, affection, connection, it was all there that night. And he said that that's where he, he started, that whole world of relationship after relationship uh, that unfortunately resulted in him contracting AIDS and, and him dying from AIDS. He had a, a girlfriend that it looked like for all practical purposes, they were going to get married, but it just was full of conflict and difficulty. 
and uh, it, it didn't work out, and that set him up uh, for, you know, being single, alone when he was 26, and he moved to uh, South Carolina. Uh, but he didn't have a, a loving, affectionate relationship with my mother the way many folks would. Uh, she was a working mother, and she was dealing with her own uh, struggles. And then she had been raised in a fairly uh, strict home, full of secrets, obviously. You wouldn't say that he was ever comfortable with women uh, from that perspective. And then when you open up this, uh, this molestation and a connection, a sexual connection with somebody of the same gender, but no emotional connection with his father, uh, it was a very, very tough place for him to be. Uh, and yet he was very successful, uh, worked for the governor of Texas and, and was a, a very loved guy, very respected guy. He was someone that I could point to and say, yeah, this is, is my brother. And he and I ironically moved to Laguna Beach, California in the same year. We worked for different people and both of us were transferred out there at the same time. And I had no idea uh, that he was struggling. I didn't know that he had moved into uh, having uh, homosexual relationships. And one time we, we, we started to argue about the theological perspective of whether or not uh, the Bible says it's okay to have homosexual relationships. And so one, one night over dinner, I thought, man, why are we having these arguments? This is ridiculous. And, and then I just said to him, I said, Jerry, look, we just need to agree to disagree about this one area about the Bible. But I want you to know that there is nothing that you could tell me that would cause me to love you any less. If you tell me right now that the reason we're arguing about this is because you're struggling with homosexuality, I will not love you one, one bit less. And that's when he said, I'm gay. Would you like to find some clarity on the issue of homosexuality, what really causes it, and how God brings people out of it? Such Were Some of You is an award-winning documentary that delivers such clarity. It's an invaluable resource for every believer, church, or ministry that features 29 former homosexuals who bear witness to the power of God to transform anyone from anything. I had to say, Lady Gaga, shut up. I was not born this way. They know that I was stuck in the same flesh, you know, struggle that they were stuck in. But I am free. We've also produced a second documentary that shows family members how to respond to their homosexual loved one. It's called, How Do You Like Me Now? When a child, parent, spouse, or sibling says they're gay. I sat my parents down for the first time. They still had no clue what was going on. And I, I said, I'm, I'm gay, I'm HIV positive, and how do you like me now? Get both teaching resources on DVD at our online store by visiting purepassion.us. That's purepassion.us. It broke my heart to hear that there was this whole other world I didn't know about with him. I didn't understand it at all, uh, but I came to understand it very quickly. When, uh, when my brother Jerry and I moved to Laguna at the same time, there was somebody else that moved to Laguna, and he was identified as patient zero. This was a flight attendant that uh, went around the world uh, with the AIDS virus and slept with about 2,000 different people, and he moved to Laguna Beach to die um, about the same time we moved there. And so he infected so many people in that town that the AIDS virus was extremely virulent. In fact, I watched that town, I watched business after business close because it was, uh, there was such a high per capita gay population there, and they were dying right and left. Back then, you know, you, you, you didn't live. You died, and some of the medication that they gave you, like AZT, uh, you would the dose was so high it would kill you. And uh, Jerry died pretty quickly. He died within two years of getting it. But unfortunately, uh, of all the places he could have moved uh, as a gay man, the most deadly place at that time was Laguna Beach. That's where he contracted the virus. I came to understand how it all happened, how the story unfolded in his life, 
uh, the molestation, the confusion, why he was almost married to this woman, and yet now he's out with these men. I was um, able to develop a, a close relationship with him, and then he got sick. And I'm so glad that we had maintained that relationship because he needed me uh, when he got sick. He told me long before he told uh, my mom and dad what was going on. I, I never rehashed scripture. I never rethought theology because in my own life, uh, he was the moral one. I was the immoral one who had slept with all these people, gotten a girl pregnant in college. I paid for her to have an abortion. Uh, I, was, I was the one who had gone I had done, you know, I hadn't slept with a man. I had killed my own baby. And so uh, I knew what it's like when you go off the ranch and you just start making it up yourself. I knew that everything I had thought was stupid in the Bible, thought applied to a bunch of old people that didn't apply to me, that everything was right on track. And so I never questioned that. The point is that I just loved him but I knew what he was doing was uh, wrong. I knew that it wasn't going to lead to a good thing, but I also uh, never dreamed it was going to lead to his death at that time. It was a dramatic change that he saw in me. Uh, it, was, it was a phenomenal change. He had seen me at my worst, and then he had seen me uh, make a 180 degree turn. And I knew that that was possible for him, but I knew that nobody could have said anything to me that was going to make any difference. You know, I, I had to be the one that made that turn. And so uh, I wasn't trying to convince him he was wrong. Uh, you know, we had argued about theology because that's what you do when you're talking about truth and God and all that. Once I realized, oh, he's trying to defend uh, the way he's living, well, there, those arguments were over. Uh, there was no re reason to do that. I just needed to try to find a way to have a relationship with him that I could live with uh, and that I could love him with. And it was very hard to, to figure that out in the beginning because this was not the guy that I knew. It was so totally different. He wasn't telling me, uh, if you don't agree that I'm right in this, then obviously you're uh, not my brother or, or you hate me or something like that. He, he, we were close. He knew this would, would be difficult. And, and just as he wanted me to accept him, he also accepted me. In other words, he didn't say, because I'm this way, now I reject who you are and all the stuff that you believe. Uh, I never had that kind of rejection thrown at me, which is so often thrown at other people. We were still brothers, and we were going to to work with this, and, and, the, and I'm so glad because when he contracted AIDS, um, he lived with me and uh, almost up to the point of death, and then um, he moved back home and, and he died in my mom and dad's home. But I'm so glad that I was able to be there, that he felt safe with me, that I could help him when uh, he needed uh, a lot of help uh, with his just, just getting up and, and doing things and going to the bathroom and stuff toward the end of his life. I mean, you know, he lost 100 pounds. He was, he was, uh, it was horrible. He looked like something out of a concentration camp before it was over. My parents were devastated. They told the people in their church that um, Jerry had leukemia because they certainly had never told them that he was gay. They didn't know he was gay until he, um, he, he had moved to from uh, California, he had moved to San Antonio, Texas. And there uh, is when he found out he had AIDS. He was in a hospital, and uh, he asked mom and dad to come over and see him. Well, they had to get in all of this uh, protective garb to go in and see him, because at the time, uh, in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, people were afraid you could get it from a mosquito or hugging or you know something like that. So they were in full surgical gear going to see their son in the hospital, and it was there that he told them, I have AIDS and I'm gay. And so here's my redneck, disconnected father who hears this news. But my redneck, disconnected father was also a great man of God. And my father 
went over to the bed of my brother and he said, you're coming home with us. We're going to help you through this. We love you. And that was the beginning of uh, kind of a, a bonding that had never occurred earlier. It's interesting that when this Southern Baptist Church, when my parents finally had to tell them, I have a gay son and he has AIDS. And the reason I'm telling you this is he's about to be on the 700 Club here and you're going to see his story. When that happened, one of the deacons in the church said, well, okay, uh, you've told us he was dying of leukemia. Now we know he's dying of AIDS. He's gay. So here's, here's the deal. We loved him when he was this tall. We loved him when he was this tall. We're going to love him through this. The deacons of this Southern Baptist Church, this was back when uh, you know, kids were being run out of town if they had the virus, houses being burned down. Here's what this redneck Southern Baptist Church of men, these, these men that my father went hunting with and killed animals with, they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going over to his house, and we're going to lay hands on him, and we're going to pray that he's going to be healed. And every day, we're going to send one of us to go over there and minister to him. Now, what they didn't understand was they would be ministered to by him. But they made that commitment. And then they told my father, here's what we're, you've been so faithful to this church, here's what we're going to do. Whatever insurance doesn't cover for his treatment of AIDS, this church is going to pay for. And whenever his brothers want to come in to see him, we'll pay their airfare to come and visit their brother before he dies. And when he died, there was an amazing full choir, full church funeral like you've, you've never seen over a kid that died of AIDS. That's what a redneck Southern Baptist church does when they're more infused with Christ than judgment, fear. And again, this is still back in the days where people were afraid of this virus. They didn't say, let's go put on protective surgical gloves and lay hands on him. These men came over there and they loved on him. And uh, Jerry just said, you know, that freed me to get as well as I could possibly get. It did something for him that uh, made all the difference in the world. What do you do when homosexuality comes knocking on your door? Author Joe Dallas has written an excellent book that answers that very important question. It's called, When Homosexuality Hits Home, What to Do When a Loved One Says They're Gay. In this book, Joe gives practical step-by-step -step advice on how to deal with the many conflicts and emotions experienced by parents, grandparents, siblings, and extended family members when they learn of a loved one's homosexual struggle. When Homosexuality Hits Home is available at christianbook.com. Restored Hope Network is a coalition of ministries serving those who desire to overcome sinful relational and sexual issues in their lives and those impacted by such behavior, particularly homosexuality. RHN connects those seeking help with local member ministries and other resources. Even as the culture embraces distorted expressions of gender, sexuality, and relationships, RHN affirms God's unchanging hope and truth that Jesus Christ transforms the lives of all who seek Him. Visit RestoredHopeNetwork.org. He was very repentant. He was uh, trying to convince other people uh, not to go down that path, or if you've gone down this path, don't, uh, don't stay on it till you contract AIDS and, and you're facing death. He also was very um, realistic about it. He wasn't telling people, hey, come to Jesus and you'll no longer have any feelings for somebody of the same sex. That was never his message, but it was, hey, uh, there's, there's some things that God wants to protect you from, and if you'll stick with him, he'll protect you from, from some emptiness and disease and even death. But you got to stay on this, this path with God, and he talked about how he got off of that path and why. He had a message that was a realistic message before he died to other people that struggled like he did. He was saying, look, you may never feel comfortable the way you want to feel comfortable, but you can sure feel God's presence and God's peace about the way you're living your life.
And I thought that was a very realistic approach to a very complex problem. The first thing that I would tell any parent, look, don't say anything, just listen. And don't defend your position, don't defend your parenting, don't defend anything, just listen. Where is this person? Let them know you care more about them and what they're going through than anything else. Now I have all these parents go, well, I certainly don't want to endorse or let them know that I think this is okay. I said, do you think your child has any question about whether or not you think this is okay? Uh, well, no. Okay, so can we get off of that? And if you need to tell them, I don't think this is okay, do that one time. Now, do what Jesus would do and try to connect with them, understand them, show them compassion for the struggle. Now, don't let your own shame or, or your judgment of yourself about not being able to save them from this cause you to totally separate from them and distance yourself. Dig in, uh, find out who is this child that I never really understood or knew. What is this culture that they live in that I didn't understand could be such a temptation to them? The second thing you have to do is you have to throw your agenda out the window that you're gonna figure this out, you're gonna have some magic words, and they're gonna change forever. There is a good chance that the path your child is on is gonna be the path that they're gonna stay on. So you need to gear up for walking with them down that path, just like God is walking with you down your path. What I've found is that parents that do that end up with a relationship that is extremely healing to that child. And if there's any wiggle room in their theology or any wiggle room in what they do with their sexuality, they're gonna wiggle back toward what the parent would want. Not because they heard the right sermon or the right lecture, but because the parents listened, understood, made the commitment to walk with them rather than try to change them. So now, in the walking with them, you have to, have to do something that they don't believe is there. You show them that it wasn't a one-time thing. You really care about them and love them and walk with them. and they. They want to introduce you to this other person and stuff. And you don't want to meet anybody else. And you say, I'm going to meet that person and try to understand what is appealing about that. And I'm going to be part of their life. And at no time do I have to worry that they think I'm okay with it. And in fact, if they ask me, are you okay with this? I'm going to say, I'm okay with you. But of course, I'm not okay with what you're doing. But let's not talk about what you're doing. Let's talk about us. Let's talk about you. So it is a heart-to-heart a -heart walk. And it's really no different than if you have a child that's struggling in any other area. You, you have to be willing to go down that path with them and sacrifice your agenda to help them uh, in the way that they want to be helped. Now, does that mean that it's okay uh, for them to bring somebody home and spend the night in their bed in your home? No, because you wouldn't do that if they were heterosexual. So you don't ever lower your standards. You don't ever have to compromise your beliefs at all if they're ever challenged. And you are able to say to them, look, I accept you, not what you do. And so you have to accept me. You, have, you can't expect me to become a different person any more than I'm expecting you to be a different person. And so there's a mutual acceptance of heart-to-heart -heart connection here, not of our behaviors. But at no point do you have to sacrifice loving a child to prove that you're not accepting the behavior that they're involved with. In the process of dealing with um, a gay child, a parent must go through a grieving process. You have to grieve all the things that you had wanted, hoped for, all the just normal things that any parent you know, would want for their child. You know, if you have a lesbian daughter and you were looking for walking her down the aisle, all those things and the grandbabies and stuff, 
Um, you, you need to let that go. You can't do that by saying, okay, well, that's fine. No, you, you have to grieve. That's a huge loss for you. So you go into a grieving process with a counselor who can help you deal with the anger and the sadness. For some people, it's easier to be angry. For some, it's easier to be sad. But both have to be involved in grieving. And I've found parents, when they grieve that and they, they let it go, then they can embrace the child in a way that uh, that child feels loved, accepted, uh, feels like I've got a parent that doesn't like what I'm involved with, but really likes me as a, as a human being. But you grieve, and that grieving allows you to forgive yourself uh, and then forgive them and give them some grace that God's given you. Because in life, it seems to me that connection is the call of the Christian. Not rejection, not hate. There's not hatred of gay people from God. There is love and understanding and compassion, compassion and a desire to bring them closer back to Him. They should pray honestly about their child. They should pray, God, bring that child back. And in the meantime, um, please protect them, uh, help them, uh, be with my child, be there, uh, help them experience and feel love that I, I can't give them right now. You just need to be honest with God. But I think uh, it's, it's okay to pray for them to change. It's okay for them to, you know, have the big breakthrough, but also pray for them in the meantime. And I, I think God honors those honest prayers. But, you know, pray for yourself. Pray that you're going to be there when they need you. And I got to tell you, um, I've spent more than five minutes thinking about this. And I've dealt with so many parents that they're so grateful that they did stay connected to a child who never came back, who never walked the path they wanted them. They're grateful that they were there for them because it expanded their heart to have compassion for other folks, other parents. And if there's anything I could encourage a parent to do, get with some other parents who are struggling with their kids. Get with them and weep with them and encourage each other and bond with each other. But whatever you're going through, if you're keeping it a secret, if you're trying to hide it from the world, uh, it's gonna be a miserable life for you. I think God really wants us to reach out. James 5.16 is the most healing verse in Scripture, or refers to healing in the most direct way. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you might be healed. So that willingness to be open and ask for prayer for yourself with other people, that produces healing in your heart. And I think that transfers over to the child that you're worried about. <laughs>